Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Divine Farmer Health Podcast. Uh, I'm Jimmy, the Acme Sensei, and I've got my, my partner, Chris, nutritionist, and we're ready to continue to talk. Uh, what are we talking about today, Chris? Uh, we are going to talk about something called resistant starch, which I don't think a lot of people have heard of. Mm. And this is going to be interesting because we have been pretty much for the last, what, five years or so, anti-carb. <laughs> yeah. A lot of, a lot of, right, a lot of paleo, you know, carnivore, keto. And we talked a little bit about this last week, about mm. the types of carbs that we want to eat. But I think this is something that I had read about a number of years ago and actually uh, was interesting to see some more research come out on it on something called resistant starch. And the, the big research project on this was done in Australia. But the one of the doctors involved in this said that he felt that this was some of the uh, research that would be going on more and more because of the obesity and diabetes epidemic. So I thought this would be really interesting to share. And so look, let's talk about what what does it look like? First of all, it it is a carb, but it acts like a fiber. So mm -hmm. we know when we eat fiber, it slows down in the digestive system. It isn't something that speed you know goes speedingly through yeah. <laughs> like a regular simple carb does, and it doesn't raise blood sugar very substantially. So we don't get a big insulin response. So this is really big for people who have diabetes or prediabetes or who are insulin resistant. It passes through the small intestine uh, fairly whole. It doesn't uh, cause an enzyme response, uh, you know, just somewhat, obviously we're going to get somewhat. Uh, there's an enzyme called amylase, which breaks down carbohydrates. And so it doesn't create a lot of that amylase enzyme breakdown. So the intestine, small intestine doesn't absorb a lot of this starch. And so therefore it ends up in the large intestine, the colon as a prebiotic. And I want to kind of dive into that a little bit towards the end here, because I get questions a lot about what are prebiotics and what food are they in. So it ends up in the small, uh, large intestine and it gets fermented by the gut bacteria, which we want. We want to get things fermented down there and grow those good gut bacteria. So what is resistant starch and where does it come from? So this is probably yeah. going to be a really interesting thing for some folks. So what it is, is it's regular food. And I'll tell you what it is in a minute, what kind of food that you let cool down before you eat it. Okay. So we're talking white potatoes, mashed potatoes. Mm -hmm. Okay. If you let those cool down before you eat them, they turn into what's called a resistant starch. Somebody's going hallelujah right now because they'll, if they could have mashed potatoes, even if they're cold, they'll eat them right now. Yeah. <laughs> um, white rice is another one. Let it cool down. And when you eat it, it's going to become what's called a resistant starch rolled oats. So you could make oatmeal and let it cool down, or you could maybe uh, make like granola, right? And and eat it as a more of a cold cereal. I don't like the store-bought granola. It's really full of sugar, but I have a great mm -hmm. granola recipe. Uh, beans are another one, uh, but beans are pretty high in fiber anyway. But if you let them cool down, they're going to be really uh, resistant starch. And I might mention here that you don't, it doesn't have to be ice cold. <laughs> Okay. It's just not steaming hot. So it would be more like lukewarm. The, the food would become lukewarm when you, when it starts to get into that changing of that starch in it. Pasta, pasta. And that's a, a, usually a, a no, no, right. For someone who wants to lose weight or uh, wants to watch blood sugars, but you can let that cool down as well. And then the other one they tested was frozen peas. So frozen peas, um, but, but you could probably use fresh peas, I'm sure it would be the same thing, but they're fairly high in fiber anyway, but those were the foods that they tested in this research study. Now you can buy something called potato starch, <laughs> uh, which a lot of companies like Red Bob's Red Mill, which is really common here in the United States, makes a potato starch. It, it's not something you want to mix up and like just chug it down. It, it's 
<laughs> it doesn't taste very good. It's kind of like cornstarch, but you could add it to some foods and then it would add some of that resistant starch to the food. So it's just a way of a very interesting research, I think, that is probably going to be more and more uh, because we're seeing, I think, more and more research done for diabetes and prediabetes and insulin resistance and things like that. But I thought it would be kind of fun to share that today and then talk about this also being a prebiotic. So before I dive into prebiotics, did you have any thoughts on that, Jimmy? Well, yeah, I mean, because that's interesting. That's this is actually news to me, you know, uh, especially, you know, white rice. So you're saying pasta, you like white pasta. You just have it cool down. Yeah. Uh, so when you say cool down, are, you know, are they talking about sticking in the refrigerator or just letting it sit on the counter and it cool down that way? Yeah. Yeah. Just letting it sit out and let it cool down. So think about this. What you could do is actually make things like pasta salad, right? Which would be cold. Or you could make something like potato salad, which is cold potatoes. Yeah. Yeah. So there's some things you can do besides letting it just sit there and get cool. You can actually make another dish out of it, or you can make a rice salad, you know, which I have some recipes for things like that, where you can add a lot of things to it and make it a, a, a nice summer rice salad. And so it doesn't have to be where you eat, you know, you're waiting for it to cool down the counter. You can actually make a, a dish out of it. So it would be more like a cold salad dish or something like that. The uh, frozen or the peas that I have are actually have a recipe for a pea salad. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's kind of an interesting thought. It was just changing it up from thinking of eating it hot to actually eating it cold. I'm wondering, I mean, there's got to be some type of chemical uh, change that yeah. from, from from heat to cold, something happens, which I, I, I'm not I'm, um, I'm not aware of. But yeah. Actually, there was a question and it was a good question. So Dominic was asking, was this a double blind clinical trial? You know, I haven't looked that up. The research that I that I read, what I can tell you where it came out of. If someone wants to look it up, it's um, it's kind of a interesting study. I need to pull it. If, if maybe I won't take the time now. Maybe we can put that in the feed. But I can pull up the actual research that was done and the a research facility that it was done at. But then the research. Uh, scientists that I was re, re, referring to that had mentioned it being a lot more research being done around the world on this, I can certainly look up his name too, and then have someone research that if they'd like. Yeah, what we yeah. can do, uh, what we can do, uh, make a note of this is uh, when you find out what research, we're going to post mm -hmm. it in our private Facebook group. Ah, so yeah, those of, yeah. Those of y'all who want to know the details, that's a, one of, another benefit of being in our private Facebook group. In order to be in our private Facebook group, you have to have joined one of our programs. So um, then there's another. Uh, there was another comment that you know research. I think you know research is flawed, and I tend to you know. So what Chris and I we're just presenting. We're just giving you options. We're, yeah. we're not saying that this this research is the end all be all. I agree. Many research are flawed. Actually, many of the research that were done, um, you know, years ago, they they've had whistleblowers to prove there was a research. Not to get too far far off topic, but there was a research back when um, you know on uh, I think it was fat. The, you know they uh, there was the food industry was paying Harvard University to do a research to prove that fat was a cause of cardiovascular disease. So they, in that time, they were encouraging everybody to eat a low fat diet. And so what happened was everybody went from eating fat to eating sugar. Actually, it was, yeah. it was paid for by the sugar industry. It was paid for by the sugar industry. So that was in the seventies. We don't hear about that. The, you know, the, 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 flaw, the flawed research until 20, 30 years later when someone whistleblows. Mm -hmm. So my point of saying all this is, yes, research is probably flawed, uh, but some is good. But how do we know that you have to test it on yourself? So, yeah. you know, I mentioned before using a glucometer. Yeah. So if, if you 
everybody's body is different. So what we're saying is, is not going to work for everybody. So the best way is to assess your body, your own body. So when you're doing these recommendations, these, these options that Chris and I are presenting, you always want to monitor your own body. And the best way is using a glucometer because a glucometer will tell you, hey, because if you eat it in like 30 minutes to an hour, it spikes your sugar. Okay, you can't be eating that, right? So yeah. that, that's, uh, and then there's another question. I mean, there's a, another statement. So Summer Rain said, but TCM teaches us that warm foods are far better for digestion as opposed to cold foods that hinder digestion. And yeah, mm -hmm. that's absolutely correct. Um, we're actually, uh, that is 100% correct. Warm foods are always better. I always say warmth invigorates, cold stagnates. But I think what you're talking about is not necessarily cold. You're just saying cool down, less like room unless temperature. You, unless, you, unless you made a salad or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Unless you made a, a, a cold salad. And I will say this about digestion. Digestion is a huge process, right? So we have millions of people on antacids. That just tells you how bad our digestion is in this country. And that would be another whole nother topic. But if you have really poor digestion, it doesn't matter if you're eating warm or cold. <laughs> yeah, you're going to exactly. digest, right? And I also will mention here too, that if you're going to eat some of these foods, if you're going to add them back into your diet, then you're going to not want to just sit down and say, oh, God, I get to have pasta every day, or I get to have pasta salad every day or whatever. You know, this is just to help people maybe not be so freaked out about carbohydrates. And I think we've gone the extreme on carbohydrates. Yeah. Like we talked about last week, we've gone completely the other opposite direction. It's just like you said what, about the fat. It went completely the other direction. And then this, that truly, Jimmy, what you talked about that research was paid for by the food industry. And it led to the whole low fat craze, which has led to, I think, our uh, diabetes and, and uh, obesity epidemic. I think it's been... 20, 30 years in the making, but I, I totally agree that research can be very flawed or very tweaked by the food industry. <laughs> yeah, oh. absolutely. And then somebody asked, and when you heat it up again, well, I, that, that I don't know. I don't, that was not the research that I read. It was just about letting food cool down. I, I don't know what happens when you heat it up again. <laughs> I don't know if it changes. No, back let to me, I'll, I'll, I'll add. So these podcasts, okay, let, let me just put a disclaimer. We are not dispensing medical advice. We are not telling you which research is good, which research is bad. This podcast is just a discussion. Mm -hmm. Chris read a research, we're discussing it, right? It's like a mastermind. So uh, the, I want to set the right expectations. You're not coming to us to, to say, oh, no, the, this is the proof that you should be doing this. That's not the point of this podcast. The point of this podcast is let's have a discussion about what's out in the market right now. And so we're not scientists. We're not experts. We're not going to dive deep into those, those research um, uh, all the time. But we're going to bring up the topic because it's a topic that people are probably thinking in their brain. And we're just going to talk through this. We don't know everything. And we don't say that we know everything. But one thing you're going to get from us, you're going to get transparency. You're going to get exactly what we think. Um, that's the benefit of this podcast. So I just addressed some of the comments uh, in, in the chat. But let's yeah. go on. Let's continue. Yeah. So let's talk about prebiotics because the this type of starch is a prebiotic. And people often will ask, what is a prebiotic? I think this prebiotic, probiotic, whole world <laughs> has yeah. gotten very confusing for people. And I think I put a post up on our Facebook page yesterday. Um, I can't remember, but talking about that, we have tens of thousands of bacteria in our gut. And so oftentimes clients will ask me, well, what's the best pro, you know, probiotic I should take? And I'm like, food. <laughs> you know, yeah, there's a lot of probiotics in there. They, we do know now, I mean, talk about research, that's a huge expanding field, but we know there are certain bacteria that can help with certain things, which is very interesting to me. And that's, that's a whole nother topic, but that when we want to have good gut health, and this is actually something that 
in this research that I'm referencing here, they showed with resistant starch that it really helped with gut health. And the reason why is, is because it's a prebiotic and it helps feed your good bacteria. So we want to, what we want to do, the ideal thing is to eat the food that will feed the bacteria. So we do a lot of things to destroy our good bacteria. And that would be, believe it or not, and I think this is probably one of the number one things is stress. Mm -hmm. And that the, there's been a, a really a lot of, of research on stress and the impact on the gut. And just think about this. H how many people have had stress ulcers? Yep. Your thoughts can have impact your gut health in a huge way. I know that there's people who, when they get stressed out, they get irritable bowel, right? They get dumping syndrome when they get stressed out. So our thoughts have a lot to do with our gut health. And we now know that they impact our good bacteria as well. So stress can impact our bacteria. Obviously poor food choices will impact our bacteria because if we're eating crap food, then we're not feeding our good gut bacteria, but we're also putting in food colorings and preservatives. And I put on our Facebook page today, it'll pop up later about what's really in a Taco Bell taco, <laughs> you, you know, or if you read, so this is pretty funny. I'm with my grandsons right now. And my youngest one is, he's definitely a carbohydrate sugar guy. I mean, he just, if, if he could eat that all the time, he would, but no. good, good thing his parents don't let him do that. But he was, but his, uh, he's with grandma right now. So I let him buy a box of honey nut Cheerios because <laughs> that's his favorite thing. And he started reading the label and he, even at 12 years old, he goes, oh, this has a lot of sugar in it. What is this name? He couldn't even pronounce it. Right. So yeah. I thought that was really cool. Um, so he, you know, eating those kinds of foods will impact our gut bacteria. We won't be giving it the good food to help, re, you know, re, reproduce the bacteria. And then also we'll be doing things to damage it and actually create a bad environment like a yeast, you know, yeast, too much yeast, too much fungus, these types of things. So we want to eat the foods that feed the good bacteria and keep it multiplying. And if you've ever been in a, in a chemistry class and looked at bacteria under a, a microscope, it multiplies really fast. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, very fast. So let, let's talk about some of the foods that are prebiotic foods. Onions and garlic are wonderful prebiotic foods. And before someone puts it in the feed, or maybe later on, there are some people that can't eat these foods, right? There are some people that are on very restricted diet. So obviously, if you know your diet and you know the foods you can't have, some people have allergies to, you know, or intolerances to onions and garlic. But I'm going to just tell you the foods that are, that are probably the top foods for feeding your gut bacteria. So onions and garlic are in there. Well, let me let me let me comment about that. So onions okay. and garlic, yeah. So. If I personally, for me, if I eat too much onion and garlic, I actually, it actually upsets my stomach. And mm -hmm. so the way that I get around with it is I have to make sure I don't eat too much raw onion and garlic. So yeah. I, I have to cook it. So if I cook it, I can eat as much as I want and it won't bother me. So in yeah. FYI, if, if y'all have, if any of y'all that are watching, uh, we got 120 people watching. Uh, if you love onion and garlic, which it's great for you and it upsets your stomach, uh, I'm not talking about bad breath. Okay. <laughs> Everybody's <laughs> going to have bad breath after you eat onion and garlic. You can't get around that. But if it upset your stomach, like it does for me, then just, you know, uh, cook it. Don't eat it raw. Yeah. And the next question somebody's going to ask is, is still do the same job if it's cooked. <laughs> True. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It, not as much, but it yeah. still, yeah, it still will. Yes, absolutely. So and the next me, one is Dan, Danny Lang. Let, me just, say really, let okay. me just say really quick about cooking. Yeah. So cooking okay. does, uh, it breaks up the, the, the bonds, the chemical bonds within a food. So it does change the food, right? So is mm -hmm. it still worth eating it? Yes, it is. Um, so you can, you can also find, and you're going to, Chris is going to introduce other prebiotic foods. So if, onions and garlic upset your stomach raw and you want to get some prebiotics, then Chris is going to go over other choices. Yeah. And dandelion greens is, is another one, but then of course, you know, that is going to be cooked uh, raw dandelion greens, probably not a good 
not an easy to digest food. And so, and I, let me just stop for a moment here and talk about kale because kale became like the superfood and everybody was eating kale all the time. And <laughs> these cruciferous vegetables like that, eating them raw every day can actually impact your thyroid function. So uh, they also are very high oxalate foods. And sometimes that's a problem for people with kidney issues. So I don't recommend eating cruciferous raw every day, but cruciferous cooked again is a different, different uh, molecular concept for your body. So you can eat more of it cooked than you can raw, but dandelion greens, I would definitely say you want to cook them. Uh, the next one is leeks, which is in the garlic and onion family, right? And leeks are wonderful. I, a lot of people don't eat leeks, but I love eat leeks, uh, leek soup. Um, I make a fish in the oven with, uh, I put topping on it and it includes leeks and they get little kind of like a little onion ring, crispy little onion ring things. Uh, they're really yummy. So it's a good place. Asparagus is another one. Asparagus is a great uh, prebiotic food. It's very high in sulfur. So mm -hmm. That's also good for your liver detoxification. So asparagus is kind of a double whammy there. It's a great one. Uh, bananas on the green side. So not really overripe bananas, but bananas that are more on the green side are going to be better for the prebiotics. And apples, apples are great. And they're full of apple pectin, which is a great fiber. Mushrooms. I actually did a video for a, a short video for us on shiitake mushrooms. And of course, in your culture, Jimmy, mushrooms are a big, big food, right? I mean, you eat oh, yeah. a lot. We, yeah. we cook them in soup, stir fry, um, all types of mushrooms, not just shiitake, small, right. big ones. Um, yeah, mushrooms are, are like uh, almost, um, I wouldn't say a staple, but it's commonly used. Um, yeah. actually, I, I wanted to comment about, it was, it just came into my brain when you're talking about leeks. So leeks, we I, we stir fry that with eggs. So in Asian culture, we stir fry that with eggs. We also make dumplings. So we mix we mix it into the dumplings, uh, and we make leek dumplings. And another thought came to my brain was like we're talking about the asparagus, leeks, garlic, like all of these foods, these prebiotics make yeah. something in us stink. <laughs> Think about yeah, it, yeah. right? Because yeah. the garlic is like your breath stinks, leeks, yeah. your breath really stink, and asparagus, we all know, your yeah. urine <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. funny. <laughs> but they're, you know what? Garlic, onions, leek, and asparagus are awful, are, are sulfur foods. Mm, yeah. Yeah, they're all high <laughs> in sulfur, which is all really good for your liver detoxification. So I will tell people, you know, if they, you know, the asparagus thing, when you go to the bathroom and you smell, I said, actually, you're detoxing. That's a really good thing. <laughs> it's helping your liver move it to the second phase of detox. So that's a really good one. Um, Savoy cabbage is my last one I have for you. So Savoy cabbage also, the Asian culture uses this more than we do. But I love, you could stir fry Savoy cabbage. I have a Savoy cabbage salad that I loved. It's, a, it's a, actually an Asian chicken salad that I make with Savoy cabbage. And most of the grocery stores have Savoy cabbage, but it looks kind of like more like a romaine head, is, led of, uh, romaine head mm. of lettuce. It's kind of a different shape versus our, we're used to seeing our round cabbage. But cabbage, I'm sure that was Savoy cabbage, but I'm sure cabbage in general. And again, that's something for some people that they don't digest well. Raw cabbage gives them a lot of gas. So I have uh, I, I have a lot of recipes for, for cooking cabbage and I'll do it even in my crock pot or, you know, or I'll do it as a stir fry. But cabbage is a wonderful food. Those, those are some of the top prebiotic foods. And there's been a lot of talk about fermented foods. Fermented foods are actually probiotics they're they already have the they help you know with the good bacteria but the fermented foods are wonderful as well well like sauerkraut and kimchi and kefir um your yogurt as long as it doesn't have a bunch of sugar in it right you're plain plain yogurts and stuff like that uh kombucha which is a wonderful i've actually made homemade kombucha you can watch it ferment it's pretty amazing so fermented foods are wonderful for the gut too so i i really encourage people instead of depending upon a bottle of probiotics because you're only going to get a few strains 
You, mm -hmm. you, if you look at a probiotic bottle, you're going to see, you know, some of them might have three or four strains. And we have tens of thousands of strains of bacteria in our gut. So the resistant starch is a probiotic, a prebiotic. And then a lot of these foods that I mentioned are prebiotics. So they are going to, uh, you know, I always say that they're, they're, you're sending down some lunch or dinner <laughs> for those good bacteria. They, they want food, you know, they want food. It's no different than your soil for a garden. If you're yeah. going to have a good, good vegetable garden, then you're going to want to put some good mulch in there, some good, you know, cow manure or stuff like that in there and help, help grow that, that there's lots of bacteria in that ground. Right. So yeah. that, think about your, your gut as a garden. It truly is a garden. So those, so those are some tips for having a good, healthy gut microbiome. <laughs> yeah. And I, I would say, yeah, if you, if you, if you ever make your kombucha uh, or make sure you film it, because like my, it reminds me of like my parents, my, my parents make that. And so they oh, do really? different types. Yeah. So mm -hmm. they get these big glass jars Mm -hmm. um huge glass jars and they'll throw vegetables you know into it uh yeah. throw some biotics and one of the jars will be uh vinegar right they'll use vinegar to, to to soak it the other one they'll use like a minimum of 40 proof vodka and so to, to, to and basically uh i believe we eat the ones that are in the vinegar and yeah. then and then the ones that is in the vodka you know, when we go back to Taiwan, they always, they'll give me a shot of it before I go to bed. And oh, so interesting. Yeah. yeah. Growing up, I used to hate that when they do that, but now I see the benefit of it. Yeah. And so, yeah. But, they, but they soak it for three months. So it has to be in a, under a cabinet, closed doors, no light, right? Yeah. Uh, it's yeah. anaerobic. So it has to be in a closed, dark space. So they soak it for three months before they even start, you know, drinking or eating it. What's in it? What's in it with the vodka? What do they put in there? Same, similar things, just vegetables they throw in, uh, you know, they'll throw in, for example, uh, even peels, like you eat the fruit, they'll cut up, they'll yeah. get a fruit, eat it, get the peel and just throw it into the container. Yeah. Yeah. So it, we don't, we don't waste, we use everything. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Actually, somebody in our private Facebook group, because we're doing lemon juice in the morning, right? So yeah. For that group right now with a, with, the, with their uh, program they're going through. And she mentioned, don't throw away the peel of the lemon, put it in vinegar mm. and let it sit. And then she uses that as a cleaning product. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that's pretty cool too. <laughs> yeah. I think we had some questions. Let's see. Garlic and honey every morning does wonders. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> That's that's a good way to start your day. <laughs> yeah. Can you put asparagus and tomatoes all together, cook and eat it? Uh, I don't see why not. Uh, the tomatoes are a little more acidic, but I don't see why you couldn't do all that with the garlic uh, and red onion. Yeah, I think the whole onion family, I, I think the whole onion family would be good. I love I per, I I do fine with raw onion. I actually love red raw onion um, in my salads and stuff like that. So if you tolerate garlic, red onion <laughs> raw that's awesome yeah there's some so good i think questions. i think what uh well, this is this is my summary this is my okay. summary of the talk today of, of of the topic today uh you definitely need to do prebi prebiotics probiotics and here's the thing you need to warn your family before you do the prebiotics you need to warn them because your breath is going to stink, your pee is going to stink, and you're probably going to let it some gas. So you need to warn, warn people, hey, I'm taking prebiotics, okay? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. And your body gets used to it, though. You know, here's the, the amazing thing is that I think that a lot of people, they first start on this, then we have all that rumbling going on and maybe some mm -hmm. unpleasant smells. But you're killing off the bad uh, overgrowth of any fungus or bacteria in the gut and uh, even uh, like candida. And it, it, when it dies off, it doesn't smell good. So hang in there because if you're new to this, if you're adding this into your diet and you haven't really eaten a lot of these foods, you may have that die off happen. And, you know, so maybe a week, give it a week. <laughs> But the body adjusts. It's like eating legumes, right? If you if you don't yeah. eat them very often, 
uh, they're really uncomfortable. But if your body, if your body's used to that kind of fiber, then, and there's some things you can do for cooking those. I won't go into that today, but to help with the gassy part of legumes, but there are foods that your body will get used to if you've not had them in the diet very often. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, our Beautiful. bodies are so, are, are so resilient. Yeah. So, uh, that is it for uh, today. Uh, thank you for being on the podcast, being on our show. Uh, we will be posting this onto the Divine Farmer Health YouTube uh, channel. So if you want to rewatch it and take down some more notes, because we Chris shared a lot of great information, uh, make sure you go back and re-listen to it. You'll probably pick up something new every time. Um, for those of y'all who, you know, if you like the way that Chris and I, you know, the way, the way that we communicate, the way we share information, um, and you want that extra help, um, you know, you're tired of doing it yourself, you want that extra help, you know, we have a program that we started on Monday, but you can still get in right now. It's our 28-day metabolic reset. You can go on to divinefarmerhealth.com and sign on. Um, it's a 28 days. Don't worry if you're late, you actually have access. You will have access to that course until August the 31st. So if you start today or this week, or even next week, it's perfect timing. Uh, we'll put that into the chat where you can get that. But, uh, yeah, if you need that extra help, if you don't just continue to join us every week, we'll see you next week, same time, same day, um, and another topic. And uh, yeah, Chris, any last words before we log off? No, I, I just also want to mention too, that uh, if you join any of our courses, you get into our private Facebook group and yes. that's where you can ask questions like you're asking them right now, or people you actually, you know, post pictures of what they're eating and <laughs> we get to have yeah. a lot of fun interacting with everybody there. So that's a great community for us to have a partnership with you. Exactly. All right, yeah. guys, have a great day. We will see you next week. Uh, bye, bye for bye. now. <laughs>